On today's episode of You Asked, TVs over the fireplace, yay or nay? Sonos versus Amazon, Google, and Apple speakers, 3D OLEDs, soundbar dropouts, and what even is the Samsung S89C? Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and this is You Asked, the show where I answer questions that you asked in hopes that I can help you and others who have the same tech questions. If you've got a question you'd like to see answered on the show, please send it to youasked at digitaltrends.com and I'll do my best to get it answered. Now normally this is where I dive straight into the first question, but before I do, I just have to take a moment to thank all of you out there for making this show such a success. I mean, no lie, I am regularly shocked at how many views this show has been getting and the comments have been awesome. It motivates me to make this show better and better with each episode and along those lines, I have a request and an apology for you. First, I'd like to do a version of this show for later this month, I'm thinking December 24th, specifically around solving tech problems that tend to come up around the holidays, right? Maybe it's a tech related thing you run into every time you visit your family, or you can think of times when you wish you had some help with tech issues related to gifts that you gave or received, that, that kind of thing. Back in the day, it could have been how to fix the blinking clock on your VCR, or how to connect your DVD player, or a simple PSA to buy a lot of batteries because you know those kids' toys aren't gonna come with what you need, and the last thing you want is a sad kid who can't play with their new toy. That kind of stuff. If something comes to mind, please send it to us at digitaltrends.com and put holiday special in the subject line so I can more easily filter them. Thanks in advance, I'm already looking forward to it. Now for a quick apology that I'll front load with some thanks. In the last episode of You Asked, we talked about color bit depth and chroma subsampling. It was kind of deep. And y'all liked it and sent some really encouraging comments, so thanks again for those. But I messed up. I said that 4K 120 with 10-bit color and 444 chroma would require trade-offs, which implied that HDMI 2.1 couldn't handle that much bandwidth. And that is not correct. According to this bandwidth calculator from Meridio, it is not only possible, but it's possible without display stream compression. So my apologies for that error. I promise to do better. Okay, now let's dive into it. And we'll start with a question from Kartik Khanna who writes, I'm buying an apartment where the only place to mount a TV is over the fireplace. I absolutely hate the idea of mounting an LG G3 over a fireplace, but was wondering if you had any thoughts about the merits of mounting it with a mantle mount to avoid the inevitable neck strain. Ooh, I have thoughts and I'm happy to share them. My stance on the whole TV over fireplace thing has definitely evolved a bit over the years. I wrote this article years ago and boy did I get raked over the coals. Now for those who don't know, here are the three main reasons it's a bad idea. One, it's literally a pain in the neck. If you can't get the TV down closer to eye level, you will end up just slightly craning your neck just enough that it can actually cause long-term discomfort or pain. I actually consulted experts about that. Number two, the viewing angle of most LCD TVs is such that even if you angle the TV down toward where you sit, you will not get all of the picture quality that you paid for. And three, the heat and sometimes smoke if your fireplace and home are not properly ventilated can be bad for your TV, both on the short term and the long term. Heat and electronics do not mix. However, and this is a really important part, what experts like me often gloss over while we're sitting on our high horse is that over the fireplace is often the only place you can fit a TV in the room due to the room's layout. I don't know what modern home builds are looking like these days because it's been a while since I went home shopping, but for decades it was extremely common, especially with so-called great room concepts, to design the room so that the only wall you can place the TV on has a fireplace right smack in the middle of it. Other walls are too short or you can't place your seating across from any of the other spaces. So lots of folks just really don't have a choice other than to have a completely separate TV room and just not have a TV in the main room. And that's just not, that's not a solution. Sometimes you have to or need to mount your TV over the fireplace. And if that's the case for you, I would highly recommend using an articulating drop-down wall mount like this one from 
mantle mount, not sponsored, that lets you bring the TV down closer to eye level. And this one in particular has a sensor built into it to indicate if the TV is getting too hot. You can even get motorized versions of these mounts so that when you turn on your TV, it just drops down automatically. This way, you protect your neck, your eyes, and your investment. Mantle Mount is not the only game in town though. There are other manufacturers like uh, Sanus, for example, that make mounts just like this. But I am a fan of Mantle Mount's products and give them an enthusiastic thumbs up. We'll put a link down in the description for the MM700 we showed you in this video in case you wanna snatch one up and help the channel out at the same time. The second question today also comes from Kartik. It's a twofer. Kartik wrote, do you have any thoughts about the merits of adding in-ceiling Sonos speakers versus just spreading around a few Wi-Fi based speakers, say HomePod minis, which are less obtrusive around the house? I really like the idea of the former, but products like Sonos in-ceiling speakers are expensive, plus little unwieldy given the number of amps needed to spread the speakers around the house. As you can tell, I'm not a huge audiophile, but admire the aesthetic advantage. Okay, so first thing I wanna call out is that Sonos in-ceiling speakers are just passive in-ceiling speakers, right? You could just really use any brand of quality in-ceiling speakers, and many of them would cost a lot less than Sonos or Sonnets. Sonos in-ceiling speakers don't have built-in amps or built-in Wi-Fi that make them so simple that you can just install them, run the Sonos app, and be done with it. As you pointed out in your question, you'll have to have other Sonos equipment. The Sonos amps are very convenient because they bring Sonos simplicity to the amplification that you need, so less equipment. Uh, but that ramps up the cost too. And this is true for any in-ceiling speaker setup. If you're lucky, the speaker wires were run throughout the house and routed back to one central location when the house was built. So all you have to do is install the in-ceiling speakers where they need to go, and then install the Sonos and amp stuff in the closet where the other end of the speaker wire is and just get it all connected. Now, I make that sound simple, but it's kind of involved. And frankly, I would recommend an installer to do that work, which adds even more to the cost. However, if you're trying to retrofit a house that didn't have that CL3 in-wall rated wire run when it was built, you definitely need an installer and you're looking at an even more expensive proposition. Using Wi-Fi enabled smart speakers may not be as stealthy, but it's gonna be way less expensive. And as a bonus, they can sometimes sound a little bit better. You could buy Sonos Era 100 speakers, or you could get any number of speakers that support Amazon You Know Who or Google Home and still have a distributed audio system that works awesome. Where it gets trickier is integrating your TV sound with these speakers. If you wanted your in-ceiling speakers to not just handle music and podcasts and such, but to also play back what you're watching on your TV, that's gonna be a lot easier with a Sono setup than it will be with Amazon, Google, or Apple smart speakers, though it can be done. Anyway, for cost and convenience's sake, I say go with practical smart speakers. But if you're just really into the idea of doing the in-ceiling speaker thing, I mean, go for it. I would just recommend hiring a pro and be prepared to crack open your wallet quite a bit. It might be worth it if you're gonna be in the home for a long time, but I would say if you're thinking about moving anytime soon, you know, in the next five years or less, I don't think you're adding to the value of the home by doing this elaborate system. These kind of things often go unused or get ripped out by new owners, according to the installers that I talked to. Tom Swift from Waterford, Ireland says, Hi Caleb, with your vast connections in the digital world and in particular TVs, could you tell me, is there anywhere in the world manufacturers still make 3D OLEDs? I heard they were great, but very expensive at the time for me to buy, but I think it would be my ultimate TV. Okay, so first off y'all, you don't have to butter me up the way Tom here is doing, but I gotta say, it doesn't hurt. Anyway, thanks for the kind words, Tom. I do appreciate it. However, I'm afraid the bad news is that no. As far as I'm aware, nobody is making a 3D OLED or any other 3D TV for that matter, and they don't have any plans to do so. I understand that some folks really enjoyed 3D TVs at home. And in fact, I know of some folks who won't upgrade their current TV because they'll lose the 3D when they do. But 3D was a massive failure for TV manufacturers. It was either expensive to do at high quality or 
the cheaper, low quality implementation disappointed viewers. Back when I first started reviewing TVs, actually, you either got active shutter glasses that would shut off your vision in one eye while passing light through the other eye, and that caused both flicker as well as dimming of the TV, a lot like black frame insertion does now. It wasn't great. Plus the glasses ate batteries for breakfast or they needed constant recharging. The other issue with 3D was that the resolution of the movie was essentially getting cut in half because the TV had to show alternating frames to achieve the 3D effect. Anyway, TV brands are aware that there are some diehard 3D fans out there. They, they hear you, but they are not going back to the old way. So until glasses free 3D can be done on the cheap and produced at scale, I'm afraid we'll have to reserve 3D as a treat that we get at the cinema. I'm sorry I don't have better news on that front, but if it's any consolation, you are far from being the first or only person that brought this up. Scott Baker writes, my new Sony 77 inch A95L is connected to a Nakamichi Dragon soundbar and it will intermittently switch back and forth from external speaker to internal TV speakers and then back again. Is there any way to fix this in the settings? There's no software switch in the sound settings menu to select external only. Is this a bug? Yeah, Scott, uh, that sucks. And I'm sorry for that frustrating situation. First off, in the A95L menu, if you click the settings cog on the remote, then the settings cog icon, then down to audio output, you should be able to select either speakers or audio system. If you have audio system selected, and you're getting these dropouts, it's because the TV is seeing the audio system, your Dragon, disappear. Now the question is, is that the TV's issue? Is it the Nakamichi Dragon's issue? Or is it an HDMI cable issue? I would buy a high quality, ultra high speed HDMI cable and just eliminate the HDMI cable as a potential culprit. Look, if it's not the HDMI cable, you could always return it. Uh, but that's because any signal issues due to the cable would definitely cause the dropouts. If you replace the cable with an ultra high speed cable, as I suggest, and it keeps happening, well then we need to figure out if this is a Sony A95L issue, and it could be because I've had some handshake problems with that TV. Ooh, which reminds me, make sure your A95L is running the latest software update. That could also fix the problem, but it could be that the Nakamichi Dragon is dropping its handshake as well, which would be an issue for Nakamichi to fix. But hey, if there are any other Dragon owners out there watching right now, and I hope there are, because you guys fill up the comments, hop into the comments now and tell us what you know about this. Maybe you've had this experience, maybe you fixed it. I'm sure together that we can get this ironed out. Uh, so this literally just in, this just came in while we were recording this episode. Kevin B writes, I have a few questions about Samsung 77 inch S89C. It seems to be an S90C, but only sold at Best Buy. I really can't find the differences between these TVs and the S89C is a crazy good $2,000 right now down from 3,600. I am so glad that this question came in. I knew this was gonna be an issue and here it is. Also, I think this is timely with the holiday shopping season. So let's get into it. Most of us tech journalists who cover TVs felt like the S89CA didn't make a ton of sense, but worse, B was gonna create a lot of confusion. And here we are. So here's the deal on the S89C. It is not just a Best Buy exclusive S90C. Unlike the Samsung S90C and the S95C, which use QD OLED panels made by Samsung Display, the S89C uses an LG WRGB OLED panel. Now, if I were to try to draw an equivalent, I'd say it's a lot like the LG C3 OLED TV in that it does not have LG's brighter MLA OLED panel like the LG G3 does. However, as we have discussed on this channel many times, the panel is not nearly as important as what is done with it. And in this case, the S89C, though it does use an LG WRGB OLED panel, will get Samsung's treatment, which includes Samsung's processing, the Samsung Tizen Smart TV interface, and a few other Samsung-only ecosystem stuff like Q-Symphony Sound, 
for coordination with a Samsung soundbar, as well as object tracking sound processing. You also get Samsung Solar rechargeable remote control, Samsung's anti-glare treatment, and Samsung's brand of gaming hub. So it really isn't just an LG C3 in a different wrapper. It's very much a Samsung TV. So I guess the main message I wanna convey here is that the S89C, though I have not reviewed it, is no doubt a very fine TV indeed and very much worth purchasing. If you want a Samsung and you want an OLED, but you don't wanna pay QD OLED prices, well then the S89C is definitely the way to go. Just be very aware that you're not getting QD OLED and that's fine. A lot of folks don't need QD OLED. I just don't want there to be any confusion on this issue, so there you go. Thanks as always for watching everyone. Don't forget to drop your comments down below. Toss us a like and subscribe if you dig this show and wanna see more. I'll see you on the next one. You Asked goes out on Sunday mornings. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like. What was the first question?